guys, welcome back. It's Lei. SpaceX is going to send a constellation of 12,000 satellites into the sky to officially become a global internet service provider. By now, most of you probably already know about the past launch, which happened a few days ago. The mission was successful. Not only was the primary mission successful with an almost successful fairing capture, SpaceX had also run another experiment. It deployed Microsat 2A and 2B into the low Earth orbit, which is a crucial part of the Starlink project. Before you start asking me questions, let me just say that I also had a lot of questions researching into this topic. Here is just a taste of things I had to research before making this video. However, as I was writing the story about Starlink, I realized that I can't possibly cramp all the information into one short video. So what I am about to do is to talk about the selected questions instead. If you have more questions regarding Starlink, tweet me at Lake Creatives and we can talk about it over there. On that topic, you should also subscribe to this channel if you're interested in topics like this. Let's start with the satellite themselves. Microsat 2A and 2B are two identical experimental satellites with a mass of 400 kilograms. If you're wondering what happened to Microsat 1A and 1B, they never reached the sky. They were canceled in favor of 2A and 2B. The primary objective of 2A and 2B is to conduct initial experiments regarding the technical details of the constellation of satellites that are about to go up into the sky in less than 10 years. For example, both 2A and 2B are sent to a 500 kilometers low Earth orbit and their orbits are going to decay every year, meaning they're going to drop to the sea if we don't do anything about it. So can SpaceX perform reboost successfully to adjust their orbits if needed? Can the solar panels on board provide consistent power to the satellite throughout its operational lifespan? These are some of the questions SpaceX need to answer with Microsat 2A and 2B. Basically, Microsat 2A and 2B are going to do what a demonstration satellite does, collecting as much data as possible, perfecting the system and ground operations so as to make sure the commercial satellites are reliable in the future. In the course of next 10 years, SpaceX will deploy 12,000 satellites into two different orbits, 4,400 satellites at 12,000 kilometers altitude, the other 7,500 satellites will be operated at 340 kilometers altitude. This is an important piece of information that I'm gonna come back to in later part of the video. Just for your reference, there are in total 1400 satellites operating in the sky right now. So sending 12,000 satellites to the sky is ambitious to say the very least. Furthermore, SpaceX is more committed to Starlink than you think. According to Wall Street Journal, SpaceX hopes to make $30 billion a year with Starlink. In comparison, SpaceX launch services are only expected to make $5 billion in the same year. This is how important Starlink is strategically for SpaceX. It is going to be the most important revenue generator for SpaceX to fund its development of the Big Falcon rocket. Therefore, this launch should not be taken lightly. It is the first step towards diversifying SpaceX businesses. Now that we understand the significance of Starlink, we can finally talk about how SpaceX is going to compete in the broadband market. First of all, let's face it. Our local internet service providers are not exactly awesome. More often than not, it's the opposite. Since most internet service providers are oligopolies in their respective countries, they really don't have a strong motive for innovation. They don't even have a strong motivation to provide a good service for God's sake. Comcast and AT&T are just two of the most notorious examples. So if all of Starlink's competitors are in this bucket, there is really nothing to worry about, right? Well, wrong. There is a fatal flaw for satellite internet. Let me explain. When it comes to choosing internet service providers, there really aren't many options. If you live in America, chances are your internet is provided by one of these guys. Furthermore, in individual state, usually one ISP dominates. For example, in Maine, the entire state is dominated by Time Warner Cable, which is now a subsidiary of Charter Communications. So this oligopoly situation is really not getting better. But whenever we have options to choose from, we usually consider three factors, speed, price, and latency. Speed and price are very easy to understand. Latency, 
not so much. But in all three categories, satellite internet is kind of lagging behind. Talking about price, it costs around thirty dollars for cable internet from Charter Communications, whereas it costs fifty dollars for satellite internet. It is easy to understand why, though. The investment for satellite internet is just higher. In terms of speed, cable companies offer 100 megabits per second, whereas satellite companies offer 25. You get what I mean, right? Satellite internet has an inferior performance currently. But the point I am trying to make is that with Starlink, the gap is getting significantly smaller. First of all, the price is gonna be lowered because SpaceX is a launch provider and it can send satellite at cost. With better reusability in the future, it could bring the cost down even further. So it is not inconceivable that the price of Starlink is going to be much lower than what we have right now, maybe even lower than cable internet. Secondly, with technological advancement in the past few years, Starlink promises to provide internet that is at least comparable to the 100 megabits per second cable internet. It makes sense because when satellite internet came out in 1997, it only had a speed of 0.01 megabits per second. It gradually progresses to reach 20 megabits per second, and not too far from now, we'll have 100 megabits per second or even 1 gigabits per second satellite internet, effectively eliminating the problem with the speed. What's then left is the latency problem. Traditionally, communication satellite are sent to the geosynchronous orbit that is 35,000 kilometers away from the Earth, and because of that, a piece of information need to travel at least 230 milliseconds to travel from your phone to your friend's phone through satellite internet. This lag might not seem much when you are sending a text message, but when you are playing games or video conferencing, waiting half a second for a feedback is going to be really, really annoying. So this is where Starlink comes in. Physical limitations could be significantly lowered by Starlink because 7,000 Starlink satellites will be only 340 kilometers away from the Earth instead of 35,000 kilometers. This means its latency will be less than 10 milliseconds. This is comparable to cable company. Therefore, with all three barriers shattered, I think Starlink could really make a difference in the global broadband market in the next 10 years. It's going to be exciting to say the very least. Well, probably not for these guys. <laughs> Thanks for watching. When the satellites reach their orbit, Elon tweeted that there is going to be a "Hello World" Wi-Fi coming up with Martians as the password in Los Angeles. Obviously, I don't live in Los Angeles, so I asked you guys on Twitter to try to connect to the Wi-Fi. One of you guys even tried it out. It didn't work, but thank you, Stephen, for doing this. That's it for today. Follow me on my social media if you want to ask me questions. I'll catch you guys later.